Welcome everyone! Good morning, Facebook land. Can you drop us some likes, some hearts, anything to let us know that you can hear us? Sorry, late technical difficulties. <laughs> late to our own Facebook Live. I'm still running on Miami time. It's a problem. It's a problem in my life, guys. We are, thankfully, we are like scaling that back a little bit. <laughs> All right, I'm just getting a couple of settings over here done and set up, and then we'll get started. But if you can hear us, definitely uh, give us a like or a heart or comment in there where you're coming coming from. Sure, where, where are, are you? you? Where, where are you from? Who's working from home? Show us some love. We're gonna share this to the Blue Night Doctor who came through. Okay, I'm sharing it now as well. We've got eight people. Hey, eight people, can you hear us? Show us some likes and some love. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. As soon as we know that you can hear us. Should I turn chat to five here? Oh, perfect. You can hear. I can hear. I can hear us. <laughs> I see a comment that popped up, but I don't see it here. Do you see it? I got it. Okay. Cool. Perfect. I'm gonna do this so that I can see all. Actually, I'll just set up real quick. Do you want to tell them about how the Q and A and how they share it? Yeah, so today's going to be an open Q&A. We want to hear questions from you guys. We've got some questions that have been asked to us over the last couple days that we're going to answer, but if you've got any more questions, drop them in the comments below. We will be doing some giveaways throughout this um, Facebook Live, and the more viewers we get, the more prizes will be unlocked. So make sure you share, 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 share it to your group, share it to your friends. If we get over 100 viewers, we will be giving away something large. Maybe a climb. <laughs> Do it. Share. <laughs> awesome. So we wanted to have this as kind of a Q&A, um, but as we are waiting for a couple of questions to come in, we had a couple of warm and fuzzy moments that we wanted to share with you. Things that make us happy. And uh, if you want to pass one of those sheets over to me, sure. There were, so if you guys have been a fan on our Facebook page for a while, then you probably saw that we did a little contest where we asked for some reviews um, in order to enter into a contest and we gave away a bunch of um, tree pouches and treats and stuff like that. So um, I, I, I've been reading back through them in times that I need like just a little pick me up. It's really fun to go back and read through those reviews. But not many of you guys have a need, uh, because you guys are already our fans, not many of you guys have a need to read back through those reviews. But there were a couple of gems that I really wanted to share with you guys. Some of these were um, written from the dog's point of view, which always like gives me the way of fuzzy. I know, I've got one here. Totally makes me chuckle. Um, well, that looks like you're itching to- I am, you know, this is something. really funny. So remember this is written from the dog's perspective, not the human's, but this is great. So imagine I'm a dog. These square things that are set up at our home away from home, I love to jump on them because when I do, the fun begins. I love raising my paw for some lip licking chicken, turning in circles from, for some delicious fishes, and sitting here waiting for my delivery of mouth-watering beef from the chief. My chief has me do all kinds of fun things for those tasty morsels. She keeps me on my toes with memory games to see if I'm paying attention to sounds she makes or ways she holds her hand. You should have your chief get you some if you want to experience all the tasties. My nose and stomach highly recommend it. So this was a review for our treats and for our climbs. That's pretty awesome. I we love to see it. Who um who wrote that review? That was from Jennifer Wright Blanton, and I wish I knew her dog's name. Was it signed by Wish? Oh, is that what that means? Yes. Okay, so the dog's name is Wish. Sorry, I did not catch that one. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, um, obviously, I hope that gave you guys a chuckle as we were as we were reading through. I love that they had like full on like rhyming stuff. Oh yeah, they did. It. like 
doing things for lip like a chicken. Yep, and then um, beef from the chief. Anyway, I just thought that they put a lot of effort into that um, and absolutely loved it. So of course we know that dogs love the climb and we've just kind of gotten to a point where we just say that like the climb is magic or it has magic dust in it because the dogs just seem to be so attracted to it. Um, so I see there's a couple of questions that are coming in on um, our Facebook live feed. So definitely make sure that you're posting a couple of questions here. We're going to um, circle back to those in, in, a, in a couple of minutes. So if you've got questions for us, it can be anything. Throw a question um, into uh, the comments below. Uh, if you're watching this from any of the other places that we shared it, make sure you go to the Blue Nine Facebook page and go to that feed in order to comment because that's the only feed that I have up where I can actually see your questions. Um, so if you're watching from like one of the spots where we shared it, like I shared it to my profile page, you'll have to make sure that you go to the Blue Nine Pet Products page in order to make sure that you um, comment your question there. Cadence Canine from Miami says, hello, amazing team. Hi, friends. Hi, Rebecca and team. Um, Michelle Alameda wants to know if we're giving away a pink line. Who knows? We have to get 100 people uh, on this Facebook Live watching us. So make sure that you're sharing it um, in order to get us to 100 viewers at a time. We've got 21 right now, which is great. We're a quarter of the way there, guys. Yeah. Come make on. it happen. Come on. Don't forget to share. So I wanted to um, share a couple more reviews, just things that make us smile here in the Blue Nine office. And this one is from Stephanie Godin. And I pulled this one because you also have a polar bear. And so I wanted you to chuckle when I read this. And so Stephanie Godin says, love the harness and leash. It has been a tremendous help on our walks. We accidentally bought a wild polar bear. She's an English cream golden retriever. And I can finally have a nice walk with her 90% of the time. Wish I had bought it sooner. So how many of you guys, by a show of likes or hearts, um, on our reactions thing, by show of likes or hearts, how many of you guys have to walk a wild polar bear right now? I'm not going to like it, but I will raise my hand. <laughs> we have a wild polar bear. He is definitely a wild adolescent right now. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about some of the struggles that you're having with um, polar right now, and some of the successes too. Give yeah. us one, one so, challenge and one success. Um, one success with little polar bear who is about seven months old. He was pulled from the Humane Society down in Miami uh, right around Thanksgiving. So he's still a young pup, so normal challenges. Um, but right now he loves to eat things. Not food, which I have a problem with all of my other dogs. He wants things. So this morning his antic was uh, we had a styrofoam clover to celebrate St. Patrick's Day, and he shredded it in the kitchen this morning. So that was not fun. Um, but he is a fantastic in his crate. He doesn't whine. Um, and potty training was really easy with him. So some of our successes with our little wild polar bear. I love it. I love it. Awesome. Uh, do you want to share? Well, actually, I'm going to remind everyone. Question and answers, we make sure that this is a live Q&A for you guys. So it's all about you once we get through these reviews. Um, so I just want to remind you guys, go ahead and put your questions um, in the comments, and we will see what we can do to answer them um, as soon as we're done with going over our reviews. But do you want to uh, go ahead and read yeah, another one? I can, but I just want to remind you guys, the questions can be about anything dog-related, anything grooming-related, training-related. If you want to ask us something about us, we may or may not answer those as well. So don't be shy if you have a question. Drop it down. <laughs> so the next review I'm going to read is from Karen Lambert Wellrow. Sorry if I butchered your last name. I use climb platforms every day while training dogs at PetSmart Press. Woohoo! To our PetSmart friends, the focus you achieve, both dog and human, is incredible. We make better progress towards our training goals, and when we use the climb, I highly recommend Blue Nine Pet Products because of their product quality, customer focus, and responsiveness. We really appreciate that. We take a lot of pride in taking care of you guys, our customers, um, quickly, effectively, and we love hearing from you guys. So give us a call, send us an email, make us smile this week. Actually, should we tell them about? So Earth Rated, actually, we're going to give a little shout out to Earth Rated. Um, they actually made <coughs> a really cool Not post. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they made a really cool post saying basically like, hey, we're still here for you even while you're like working from home, we're stuck at home, like feel free to send us like a picture of your dog, a story about your dog, any product questions that you might have. But they were basically like just asking like, like please just email us. Like they're all working from home too. Um, so they're, you know, looking just for engagement from their customers. So if you've got training questions, if you uh, just want to share a cute picture of your puppy, 
I swear, any time that we get breeders that send us emails of puppies playing on climbs, one of our customer service reps will like run around all the <laughs> office spaces like, look at this, look at this, look at this. Puppy videos make our day. They seriously do. I love it when they pop into my office and they're like, hey, check this out. Like, look who, like, like look what so-and-so sent us. So yeah. um, feel free to send, send us puppy pictures. I have like major puppy fever right now. Um, <laughs> all right, we've got one more to, uh, review that we wanted to share with you. It was something that gives us the warm and fuzzies, and you know what? My computer is going to die. All right, I'm, I'm keeping track of questions on my phone here, so okay, if you're in here, it's great. Fantastic. We do lots of reviews. We're starting to get some questions in. All right, awesome. So our last review comes from Marsha Mayer, and I probably pronounced that. It's got three vowels in it, M-A-I-E-R. Uh, it's got three vowels in the middle of it. How do you pronounce A-I-E as a vowel? Meyer. Meyer? 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 Okay. Um, I feel like I need to go back to here. Please call us and tell us how to properly <laughs> pronounce your name. So she wrote, I absolutely love the Blue Nine products. As a dog trainer, it's one of the brands I recommend most. The balance harness is amazing and it actually allows you to get a proper fit. And the climb, oh, how I love the climb. We use it in every group class I teach. The first cue our dogs learn in class is to go to their climb. The climbs are always out during tricks. Trick class or fitness class, they're used to teach door manners or to help dogs learn how to be calm for the dog in person greeting part of the CGC test. Dogs that need help with confidence are taught that the climb is a safe spot and we use it as a tool to help with their training. I use them to help dogs with reactivity issues as well. Besides the flicker and treats, it's my most used tool and I love it. That makes us so uh, happy. Warm and fuzzies! <laughs> so um, I hope that this gives you guys the warm and fuzzies too. Like it makes us happy when we get reviews um, like that from, from you guys as customers. We aim to please. Uh, so speaking of aiming to please, we have a few questions in here that we want to answer for you guys and give you guys some help with. There is one that I saw in here. Um, I've seen a couple of them actually, and they're asking for favorite things to do when like you're locked up in the house with your dog or yeah. like, homebound exercises. Absolutely. So w one part of this that I want to share is that like while there is, you know, the COVID-19 stuff is going on, we're spending more time at, time at home with our dogs. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be inside with our dogs. Like we can take our dogs for walks, go for hikes, um, do like different different things with our dogs as well um, that don't require us to be in the house. So I still want to encourage you guys like think a little bit outside the box, go for a hike, take your dog for a sniffari. A sniffari. Tell me a little bit more about sniffaris. So um, if you have a dog that loves to use its little sniffer, its nose, and some dogs like to use it more than others, it's a really great outlet and decompression for them to just let them go for a walk and let their nose leave them. So if your dog is walking with nose to the ground, this isn't the time to practice moose use walking. This is the time for your dog to explore, use its nose, take in all the information that they're getting with their nose. So I like to do this with my chocolate dog, Diva. She's about eight and a half years old, roughly. She's also a rescue, so I don't know exactly her age. Um, but we have a lot of farms out here in Iowa, and her favorite thing to do is take me to where the cows are. And I will just let her kind of lead the way, or her nose knows and leads the way. Obviously, I make sure that we're not going to go anywhere dangerous or <laughs> anywhere that we shouldn't be walking, trespassing. But she'll just take me right down the street, around the corner, and we're at this big cow pasture. Um, and we'll just sit there and watch the cows for a while. So it's her little adventure and her little sniffari, but we let her nose lead the way. I love it. Uh, so to talk a little bit about some like enrichment ideas for inside the home, one of the things that I've done is I have created, like, Nat Geo Wild outside my front yard. <laughs> have, yeah. So I have, um, there's like squirrel feeders that you can buy. I've got this one that's like on a bungee rope. Um, and it's like these like corn cobs that are on a bungee rope. And so the squirrels have to like reach up in order to get to the bungees and the, uh, or to the food. And it actually has like a bell on it. So like it alerts us <laughs> when, there's, when there's a squirrel that's interacting with it. So of course that has totally become like a favorite Saturday morning activity with my dog as we sit on the couch, we drink our, I drink my coffee, uh, and we squirrel watch together. We would probably drink some coffee, but, um. <laughs> Um, and then I also have several bird feeders out there as well. So um, every time that I like pop in on my cameras and watch and see what my cat is doing, she is 99% of the time, she's sitting in the windowsill watching the birds outside the window. So 
I think a lot of people are like, oh, well, that's an investment. Yeah, sure. It's like a $20 uh, bird feeder and it's maybe a $15 like bird feeder holder and then uh, whatever, $10 in bird seed. And once you have like that set up, it's really not a lot of maintenance. I fill up the bird seed like once every two weeks or something yeah. like that. And you know, it just keeps everyone entertained outside my you know, outside my front yard. I've gotten a little extra with it. So if you really want to see it, go check out my uh, Instagram stories and you'll see that I've got like so six bird feeders and all that stuff. The city girl in me is going to talk now and say, well, I am originally from Miami, Florida. We don't have cow pastures and hiking trails. All of that. So, what are some other options that we can do actually inside our homes? Our friends in San Francisco and New York City now that are actually homebound and can't go outside. What do you want to do? Um, this is a great time to teach an off switch for your dogs while you're trying to be on a conference call or work from home. While that seems like it's kind of a lazy thing for your dog to do to just be laying around, it takes a lot of mental strain on a dog to understand that settling while you're working on your computer or sitting by your sitting on your couch is also a really good thing. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about teaching an off switch. Yeah. This is great for your high drive off seat, your border collies, your young puppies and stuff like that. Yeah. So if you have a dog that anytime they're in the house, they're spinning around, trying to engage you, bringing you toys, barking, pawing at you, uh, pacing around the house, you know, basically refusing to settle, uh, then that's a dog that needs to be taught an off switch. Uh, so I have different rules inside my house, like no rough housing in the house. So they can, you know, uh, if I have a guest over, they're fine to like chew on each other's faces on the carpet. <laughs> but if they're running or zooming or whatever, it's, it's an outside activity. Yeah. And so I'll just kick them out into the backyard and, and they can wrestle and all of that's all fenced in and lit and I keep an eyeball on them. Uh, so that's like, that's one thing is just not allowing that kind of rough house play in the house helps kind of tell them you know what's appropriate for indoor activity and what's not. Um, and then actually teaching that off switch or actually teaching a dog how to settle. A lot of people will use a, um, a climb table or a place board or you know a couch ottoman. Couch ottoman. You know, whatever you have at home. Um, obviously we make the climb but our concept is always elevation is what matters. And so if you need to build something or you need to, you know, use couch ottoman, then, then kind of do it. Um, or obviously benefits for the client. But what we do there is we train our dogs to go to that spot and lay down on cue. And what's really important with this, though, is that you're rewarding your dog for any signs of relaxation. And so it can be the absence of behavior, it can be the absence of the standing up and laying down, the absence of any vocalization. The foot kick is the, my favorite. The foot kick. <laughs> oh, yes. My dogs do that. <laughs> yeah, so Huff will be like laying down on the on the climb and he'll, he'll like he'll be laying down, like on his hip. And if you like ignore him for a little bit, he'll like kick his foot like this, like I'm relaxed. Look, look how down I am. Look, look, look how down I am. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's absolutely hilarious to watch him doing that. But um, so looking for those kinds of relaxation. So things like taking a deep breath. That size down, that full like relaxed. When they roll over yeah. onto their shoulder, you can, you can reward that. Uh, when they put their head down. And so, you know, those are some things too that if you reward them too quickly sometimes, then the dog is like, oh, it's head down. This is the behavior she's rewarding, it's head down. I'm going to put my head down. Yep. Um, and so your reward delivery is really important too. So slowly grabbing a treat, slowly delivering it to your dog. How you do all of that is just as important as looking for the behaviors that you're rewarding as well. Yep. Um, one of the things that some people start to struggle with though is, is um, they get into that habit of like, okay, my dog stood up, so now I'm going to give him a, a, you know, a lure him into a down um, and give him a treat for laying down. And that builds this bad behavior chain of laying down and relaxing for five minutes is hard. But if I stand up, she's going to tell me to lay down and then I get another treat. And so it creates this bad behavior chain. So what's really important is that if you start to notice that your dog is standing up for you to tell them to lay down, for you to give them a cookie, or if they're doing those like uh, those behaviors of putting their chin down or kicking their leg out to show you like, I am very relaxed, look at, look at this behavior, I am very relaxed, um, then it's important to kind of ignore that. And so sometimes what I'll do is just tether a dog to the climb or if they're you know laying at my feet, I'll just step on the leash and ignore them for 20 or 30 minutes. 
Um, and so for the first, you know, maybe five minutes, they're gonna be annoying as heck, uh, <laughs> by you know, pawing, making noises, all that stuff. But if you can just step on the leash or, or sit on the leash or whatever you need to keep them within your immediate vicinity, they stay there, um, eventually they relax, and then you can reward that, reward the relaxation, or take them outside and, and take them for a play break. So that's a great way to teach an off switch, but I still don't feel like we've given them like new games that they can play. Inside the house. Inside games. So let's brainstorm that for them. While we brainstorm that, I'm going to remind you guys again, share this post. We're up to 28 viewers. We're still only a quarter of the way there. We want to give away a climb, guys. We want to spread some joy. Help us help you. Yeah. Share, share, share. Um, and actually, we can give away a couple of other prizes, too, as we're going through this. So, um, since you've got it up, call someone out by name. Hi, Janet from Miami. A lot of Miami peeps here. I'm going to take credit for that. Awesome. Any Hi. tips on doggy mental enrichment for pets at home and at daycare? So, um, oh, I like that. mind if I talk about doggy daycare for a bit? Well, what I, when I said call someone out by name, I meant let's reward them with a prize. So, oh. Janet. Janet, you are, you are, you, you've won a, you've won a prize. Uh, you've won one of our Inspired Dog Training Treat Pouches. Please send us an email at customerservice at blue-9.com and let us know your complete ship to address. We'll get that treat pouch headed your way. Take it away, Jess, with whatever questions you have. Absolutely. So doggy mental enrichment. What are some things that we can do at home and doggy daycares? Um, I come from the daycare world, so enrichment is always a big discussion when you've got multiple dogs. I live in a four-dog household. Mental enrichment is also uh, a part of our day-to-day routines. The easiest way to do it is during meal times. So my dogs never eat out of a bowl. It's as simple as that. And if they are, they're using a kin bowl. Shout out to our friends at Kin Inc. over there. Yeah. Um, so food puzzles, frozen and stuffed Kongs or topple toys from West Um We do a lot of cookie scatters in the grass as well. If it's nice out, we're kind of in mud season here in Iowa, so I'm doing less cookie scatters outside. But this also encourages my dogs to use their nose and start thinking and foraging around for the grass. Probably doesn't help my foraging problem in my kitchen. <laughs> um, so that's one easy way that can be incorporated both at home and doggy night daycares is, um, you know, kenneling and feeding time in a, in a kennel environment is obviously, I don't want to say stressful, but it's high arousal time. You've got all of these dogs that are barking, they're all excited, they're waiting for their food, they're at the end of their kennels waiting. How do we bring those arousal levels down, bring barking levels down, and just get everyone to a lot more relaxed? Um, one of the things Jamie mentioned was our own actions and the way that we're handling food and, and delivering treats and rewards and stuff like that. So making sure that we bring our own um, energy levels down, if you will, uh, you know, making sure that we're delivering with calm but confident, um, you know, approaches to giving our dogs rewards and stuff like that. It's so easy to prep Kongs while dogs are in play groups and have them distributed as the dogs are going into their crate. You can have them in the dog's crate or room uh, waiting for them. So that way you don't even have to deal with the barking and the waiting for the, the anticipation, I guess, that can bring a lot of arousal levels up for dogs is when they get anxious to wait for their food. So um, delivering food in their rooms or their crates before they get there, that encourages your dogs to want to go into their crates. Um, you know, talking about puppies, crate training is a big aspect of it, or place training, whatever, whatever you are comfortable using. So if my dogs are, my command to go to their crates is go to their rooms, and all four dogs know which crate is theirs. A lot of times we'll have the food in there waiting for them, so that encourages them to get to their crates a lot faster because they know that their crates are there, and they're immediately relaxed because they know that their food is waiting for them. So we can start to phase it out and say, go to your rooms, everyone goes to their crates, and then they get their food delivered, um, and everyone's kind of just laying down and waiting for them. So those are a few mental enrichment games that you can do just around mealtime. Yeah, to kind of um, talk a little bit about some of the food enrichment toys and, and how, how we can do that, I encourage you guys to think about like what does your dog really enjoy doing and what's the function of some of their behaviors. So if you think about um, if you have a dog that just chews on everything, then maybe the enrichment or food puzzle toy that you give them is going to be something that they need to gnaw on a little bit more. Uh, so maybe it's a bully stick or a, you know freeze dried turkey neck or something like that that satisfies their need to chew something. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have a dog, um, and our terriers are often like this, or our badger dogs, the ones that really love to dig. And so maybe we're giving them a food puzzle toy that requires that they dig in it. So something like a snuffle mat or the I dig by, um, oh goodness, I fetch? Yes. 
So uh, different puzzle toys like that where they have to dig in order to get to the snuffle food. mats. Snuffle mats, yep. Um, or maybe you have a dog that really enjoys licking things. So um, you know, what are some ways that we can give them that option for licking things? Um, and then also thinking about you know physical, phys not just mental stimulation, but like the physical enrichment too. So a slow feed bowl is great. Don't get me wrong. If, it's, if that's all that you have, do that. Um, but if you have toys that move and wobble around and they can use them all over the house, that's physical stimulation yeah, too. The dog is knocking that whatever it is called wobbler across the house um, and chasing it around in order to get the food out of it. That's physical stimulation too. So if you start to you know kind of parse out these different enrichment levels, how can I get my dog to sniff? How can I get my dog to lick? How can I get my dog to dig? How can I get my dog to chew on, on something? Uh, how can I get my dog to move and forage and all of that? So we start thinking about all of these different sensory experiences that our dogs have and what our dogs like the most. Mm -hmm. That can help us uh, really tailor an enrichment program to the dog itself. Absolutely. Uh, so actually, I wanted to go back to the climb. Flipped over on its upside down um, where you store the legs. Throw some cookies in there and then put dog toys on top of it or a towel or a blanket on top of it, that's gonna encourage your dogs to sniff and nuzzle and paw the towel off of it, move the move the toys around in order to be able to get to the treats. So this makes a really cool, big, slow feed bowl that you can make more and more challenging for your dog depending on depending on their needs. Do you have another question pulled up or another person we can Yeah, up? so another one of the things is asking, you kind of just answered it, what are your, some of your favorite extraordinary manners games for stays coming on call, basic manners? I know you're gonna go off on a tangent real quick, but I just wanna call out a couple of our questions so that we can see them out. Another one is, what, um, what are other things that we can do with multiple climbs other than building a bridge? So what are some of the little obstacle courses or things like that that we can do um, to help with some of that physical activity within the home too, if you have multiple climbs? I'm not gonna remember all of these. Okay, which one do you want me to answer first? I got excited about, there was, there was one about recall games. Yes, so manners and basic commands. Let's go back to that one. Okay. But we've got a couple of people already replying to Michelle and your question is what can you do with multiple climbs inside the house? This is an awesome time to get creative with building obstacle courses. So the climbs can be very enticed. So you can have climbs with legs, without legs. You can have climbs installed at an angle uh, with only two legs installed. Mm -hmm. um, and someone here is having a great, they have a great idea. They combine it with um, either other inflatable fitness objects like a fit bone or a peanut, couch cushions, pillows, whatever you have around the house. You can even make a little like fort and have your dog like teach your dog to get confident going under a blanket or something like that. And a lot of dogs don't Ooh, don't cool one. Yeah, that's that's a fun one. I just thought about that right now. I'm gonna do this later tonight. Drape a blanket over a couple climbs and teach your dog to go through the blanket without any apprehension. Yeah, I love it. All right, now you can talk about manners. Well, no, I'll touch on that one since since you were talking about it too. So when I was younger, I like we didn't have climbs, <laughs> and I have this little lots of sheet to named Pickles. Pickles, um, pickles. I loathe pickles. It's almost a phobia. It's like I stared at me when she said pickles. <laughs> so um, we were like in the process of moving, so we had a ton of boxes, and I created this like full-on agility obstacle course with like a frame, a tunnel, which was basically just like a long box that he had to run through, um, and like different different things uh, that he had to crawl up and over. So yeah, absolutely, use different objects that are in your environment. Uh, in order to encourage your dog to, you know, to, to do different different behaviors. I think one of the cool things is if you have three climbs, you can set up a tunnel. So you have like a climb and then another climb and then a climb a on tall, top. A tall climb. A tall climb. What would be really cool is to like drape a blanket over that three on one side so the dog has to basically do an agility shoot. So it's great yeah. for, um, you know, confidence building to have things touching their face as they're going yep. through it. Um, and then you know, that's it's, it's a fun, fun game, game that you can do. Fun game. Who doesn't love to build sports? Yeah. Um, reading stories to your dogs, that's another fun enrichment thing. And you can do that inside of a doggy daycare facility during like nap time too. Yep, Read story time. Story, stories for them, I think that would be cool. There's a lot of great um, therapy dog organizations that do reading with Rover, where kids will yeah. go to the library and read to therapy dogs to help them with their reading skills. Um, all right, so where was the one that was asking about manners? From Jojo. I'm sorry, I'm gonna butcher your name. Jojo. Uh, yeah, so Jojo, we're not even gonna try. 
What are some of your favorite extraordinary manners games for stays coming when called? Basic manners. This is also a great time to practice all those basic manners in your home. Yeah. So, um, one of my favorite games is actually doing recalls past an open food bowl and loose leash walking past an open food bowl. And so I do a setup of the climb. I think we did this with Trevor Smith from the Doggy Dojo once as a as a, an enrichment game for one of his programs that he had going on. So basically what I do is I um, leave a dog in a sit stay. If I only have one climb, then I leave a dog in a sit stay on the ground. And then, you know, five feet off of the dog's path, I set an open food bowl. And then I, you know, walk 10 feet away and I have a climb next to me 10 feet away. And so what I do is I recall a dog to the climb. And because the dog has a lot of value for being on the climb, they almost become magnetized to it. So even though they see that there's a food bowl five feet off of their path or two feet off of their path, they're so magnetized to the climb that they're going to recall past it. If they do that successfully, I give them a jackpot on the climb for coming to me, and then I send them to the food bowl, and I say, okay, go get that. If they ignore me and they go to the food bowl, I try and make sure that I set it up in a way where I, where the dog can't get reinforced. So I either put a lid on it or um, pretend to put a cookie in it the first few times until you know that your dog's not going to steal the food. Um, what you don't want to do is scream leave it at your dog from across the room because if you say leave it and they don't leave it, then they just learn that leave it means I can have it if I eat it fast enough. <laughs> um, and that's not what we want that, that cue to be. So that's a really fun game to, to play. Um, if you're worried about practicing it with your dog on a recall stand, st standpoint where you're going to be far away from it, what I would say is work on it with loose leash walking first. So can I loose leash walk from climb to climb? Again, giving the, the dog the targets to go to past that food bowl, um, and can my dog be successful? And if we're on leash, then I can help my dog be successful by not allowing him to get to the treats. So that's a really fun one. Um, and then also stays, I just do like just 101 things. I throw toys at my dog, mm -hmm. I throw treats at my dog. Ask them um, like squirrels. Yeah, ask them those like trigger words. Um, and then also things like, you know, handler distractions, jumping up and down, or think of like realistic things. Like I want my dog to, you know, do a sit stay while I take pictures of him. Or do a sit stay while I- Don't want to interrupt, but this kind of is answering one of the questions that we have. Um, do you have any tips for keeping your dog quiet when training another dog? So. Um, giving that dog a job um, to do while you're training another dog and holding a sit or a down stay on the climb or in the crate if that's what you have to use or some sort of elevated platform, that's a really great way to, to help with whining while you're training other dogs. I have that issue too with some of our dogs. Yeah, give them a job to do. Hey, we've got this one from Hannah Schoolcraft too. Shout out to Hannah Schoolcraft for putting this um, question in here. You also have one uh, treat pouch. We're just doing these at random. Uh, you want a treat pouch, so send us an email at customer service at blue-9.com to claim your treat pouch. But she's got this really cool question on here that says, any tips for a newbie working as a kennel tech at a daycare? I just got hired Friday. I come from pet study background, so I do have extensive dog experience. What I was going to say is, what are some of the organizations that we should look at becoming a member of or looking to continuing education for for being... In the daycare world, absolutely. First and foremost, go check out our friends, the Dog Gurus. They've got so many awesome resources for the daycare and um, boarding environment. They've got training manuals. They've got um, knowing dogs, uh, off-leash play uh, materials. And so, so many resources. Go check out the Dog Gurus. Another association that you might want to consider being a part of is IBPSA. That's the International Pet Boarding and Services Association. They also have a really full resource um, library for educational content. And then uh, the last plug I'm going to do for my uh, pet boarding and daycare friends is look up PAC, Professional Animal Care Certification Council. This is the equivalent to the CPDT, which is the Certifying Council for Dog Trainers. Yeah. So let's regulate our field, um, prove to pet parents that you guys know what you're talking about. So our friend Hannah, um, one quick tip, I know we gave you a lot of resources, is learn your dog body language. Managing groups of off-leash play, the best thing that you can have in your arsenal is being able to read dog body language from a mile away. Um, understand what um, just even posture changes mean or a different entail placement, all of that stuff. Learn your dog body language. And if you want more information or direct links to those resources, feel free to pop me an email or pop us an email, customer service at blue-9.com. I'd be happy to point you in the right direction for all that. I love it.
I love it. Um, Julia Naraki asked, speaking of food puzzles, what are some favorite things that you stuff them with? Our go-to is kibble mixed with pumpkin and non-fat Greek yogurt. We are always looking for some new ideas. I think that kind of going back to what does your dog find the most reinforcing, yep. but also what, what serves their need. If you have a dog that likes to lick the carpet or lick toys, I've seen some dogs that are like neurotic about yeah, this, then let's put some things in there that encourage them to do more licking. So cream cheese, peanut butter, spray cheese, um, that sort of thing. Using if, a licky mat? Yeah, or use a licky mat in, instead of, you know, calm that you're stuffing it with. Um, and then, you know, if you have a dog that just loves to gnaw on things, and that's polar right now. Polar just loves to chew. Yeah. So finding things that they can really engage in chewing on. So uh, there's some food puzzle toys out there where you can stuff like a bully stick in them, and it makes it harder for them to get to the bully stick, which encourages a lot more chewing. You know, that would be something that, that I would look at. So understand what your dog, you know, look at what your dog's problem behaviors might be. Like, I hate it when they lick the carpet, or I hate it when they chew on the drywall. Uh, or I hate it when they're just running around crazy in the house because they have too much physical energy. Let's give them something to lick, something to chew, and something for them to paw around the house. Think about the function of the behavior that you're trying to fix, um, and, and that'll help guide you on what you're going to give your dog. Um, quick tip if you have a dog that isn't a huge fan of toys or chewing on appropriate objects. Um, I know a lot of dogs aren't toy motivated. I've got one that he could care less about toys, and that's my little hefty man. Um, but if you have like a fleece tug toy, I want to emphasize a fleece tug toy, not a rope dog, to a dog toy. Um, dip it in some chicken broth, veggie broth, whatever you use in order to entice your dog's flavor and freeze it for a little bit. So it kind of absorbs all of those flavor and then offer it to your dog. That's going to encourage them and entice them a little bit more to chew on something appropriately. And then you can start to get a little bit of, um, of tug action perhaps, and then they're going to want it a little bit more. I just got an idea from one of the other questions that are on here. If you have multiple dogs in your house, uh, there's a fun game that you can play for mental enrichment, and that is uh, cycling through all of your dog's basic cues that the dogs that you have know, and rewarding only the ones that do it the, like, the, the most quickly. So if you get all four of your dogs in front of you and you ask all of them to sit, and then you reward whoever whoever sat. I'm gonna run about computer treasure real quick. And then, <laughs> and then um, you can also ask your dogs to down. And then whoever you know does that down cue, they get a reward for that as well. Uh, and so if you have multiple dogs, then only the first one who does it, or only uh, only the first couple that do it, are the ones that are going to um, get that reward. So that might be a fun way also to like encourage your dogs to do uh, more with their basic cues. And uh, Jess is like booking it with a charger because of, apparently we just got a we got a ding. <laughs> our computers just can't hold a charge, man. We do too much with them. Careful that you don't slam it down. I know. Yeah. I know. Woo! Sorry, you guys are getting my arm right now. There you go. All right. Awesome. Um. So just going to um. Just gonna remind everyone we are giving out some treat pouches at random while we're on this Facebook Live. Um, but if you guys share this, if you're finding anything that's valuable inside of this q and I encourage you guys to share it. Um, depending on the number of views, we're going to release another larger prize, not just one of our Inspired Treat pouches. Uh, we'll release another prize once we get up to 100 people yeah. um, on here. So feel free to share this. If you find anything that's valuable, if we get 100 people at one time on this Facebook Live, then we will release a larger prize. Uh, so where are we at now? Another question that I want to make sure we address from Susan Hernandez says, I just got my balance harness and I'm having trouble correctly fitting it on my dog. Is there a detailed video showing on how to fit the harness properly? Yes, there is. I'm going to let Jamie talk about it when I catch my breath. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so uh, there's a couple of things. We really value high touch customer service here at Blue Nine. So um, we want to give you a tailored experience. If you're having trouble fitting your balance harness, pop us an email with a couple of pictures of your dog. One, we just want to see your cutie pie. And two, if you send us a couple of pictures of your dog wearing that balance harness, we can tell you which straps might need to be um, shortened, which ones might need to be lengthened. But we do have an excellent video on our YouTube channel um, called our troubleshooting and fitting tips for the balance harness. 
Now it doesn't go, you know, step by step of like, I'm going to shorten this strap to do this, or I'm going to lengthen this strap to do this, but it shows you what a proper hip's supposed to look like on the dog that's in that video. And it also talks about some of our common questions a lot of people ask about, you know, the top strap. Is it supposed to stay right along their spine? Nope, it's supposed to turn and move and twist off to the side with your dog. Totally normal. So that video would be a great resource for you. But like I said, we value high touch customer service. So if you've got questions, send us a picture of your dog in the harness. Ask us your questions and we would be happy to give you tailored responses specific to your dog. Uh, so, so that's definitely an option for you. Yeah. Uh, any more questions, guys? Let's see. We, we're getting a lot of great questions. Um, some of them are coming in a little fast, so we apologize that we're like scrolling on our phones here. Yeah. Um, I think we've got some. I think, I think we've covered a lot of different things. Yeah, we have. I hope you guys have found some value in all of this. Um, appreciate all of you guys who have shared it, who have commented and asked questions. Again, if you guys found anything of value inside of Ooh, this video, I encourage you to There's share. one more that we did not talk about, and I think you're going to have fun with this. Uh -oh. Any tips on setting up a camera and how to make a training plan? Ooh. Nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> That's also from Hannah Schoolcraft. Oh, I love her. Make sure you email us, Hannah. Yeah, Hannah and Janet have so, uh, are two winners so far for, for the uh, treat project. Why don't you select two, two or three more? Somewhere in there. Um, so, how to set up a camera. I'm really nerdy about my camera stuff. Um, I was really disappointed we were a little bit late to get on this Facebook Live because I bought some new mics. We tested them out with one uh, one piece of equipment, and it, and then when we tried to get it to work with another piece of equipment, it wasn't working. Um, so I'm really nerdy. I invest a lot into it because it's my hobby. What I would say is this. You can use your phone to videotape your training sessions, and I encourage you to videotape every single training session. Watch it back. Delete it if you want to. Hold on to it to look back on a year from now, whatever you want. You can invest 20 bucks or less into a decent tripod. Yep. Really like the ones from Joby. Um, and then also look for a decent uh, phone holder to go on that tripod. And a lot of times you can get, you know, the whole package all in one for under 30 bucks pretty easily. Um, and those are like, are, are the best. I will set mine up um, sideways, horizontal landscape. And I'll also do it so that it's like in selfie mode so that I can see myself to make sure that I'm still in frame. So when I'm doing different things with my with my dog, I can make sure that we're still in frame. Uh, you can also, if you're like getting really nerdy about it, you can invest in some different lenses that you can put on your iPhone. Moment has some that are like really pricey, but there's a couple of other ones again for under thirty bucks. So sixty bucks, you can have like a pretty awesome setup. Yeah. Um, and those will make it. Uh, you can get one. I would encourage you to get one that's wide angle, and that will give you a more a bigger frame of reference. Uh, or field of view for while you're doing your training with your dogs. As far as setting up a training plan, document, document, document. Um, I will put, sometimes put mine into a planner, like I want to work on these skills uh, uh, during the evenings on these days, uh, but having, you know, keeping track of like where you were at in your training session definitely helps. Uh, so, you know, find a journal that you like that you can write things in so that you can keep track of what cues you're working on. I also find that having a set goal, like going to a show or something like that, entering it into a trial. I need deadlines in order to work on stuff. Definitely gives me a lot more motivation. <laughs> and it also has a great way, of, like as soon as you sign the like entry form, your dogs have a great way of like breaking everything that they ever know. Sure. Like it breaks all of the skills and it really puts a magnifying glass to anything that you need to practice. Um, um, uh, so those those are a couple of tips. I use my home security cameras as my cameras for training. So I have one in my training room. I also use it for under twenty bucks. I use the wise cams. Um, it's mounted on my wall, and I can I have a little SD card in there, so all of my training plans uh, are recorded wherever we do them in the house. Um, so if I forget to set up a tripod or something like that, I can just go back to my cameras. May not be the right angle or something that I want, but at least I can I have it I have it recorded. I love it. Hey, so Michelle Al Almeida, Almeida. Almeida. Uh, shout out to you as well. You've been throwing a lot of great questions in here. You are our next winner um, for our Inspired Dog Training Treat Pouch. Please email us at customerservice at blue-9.com with your complete ship to address so that we can get that sent out to you. But you've got this great question on here. Do you recommend using the client for cooperative care if you also oh, use it for yes. training? Great question. And so, yes, but with a caveat. 
So in my cooperative care, what I do is uh, my dog always has a choice, and so the climb becomes kind of a start button behavior. So I'll pull out all of my torture devices, aka the brush and the nail trimmers. They don't have to be torture devices. <laughs> <laughs> but a, a lot of dogs do find them that. So I will pull those out, and I'll, I'll even you know, set them on the edge of the climb, and I'll make sure that they don't you know jump on them or whatever, and I'll kneel down next to the climb with high-value treats and all of that. If my dog is ready to engage in that specific exercise, he'll hop onto the climb, He'll get paid for that, for that behavior, so a couple of pieces of hot dogs. And then I'll pick up the nail trimmers or the brush or the blow dryer or whatever it is that I'm going to, you know, be, be torturing him with. <laughs> uh, not actually torturing, but you know, engaging with him with. And so I'll pick those up. If he chooses to stay on the climb, then again, he gets uh, a, a food reinforcer for that. And then step by step, we do it. So I'll pick up his paw, trim one nail, you know, let go of his paw and give him a cookie. At this point, it's his choice. If he wants to jump off of the climb, he's more than welcome to. And if it's become too stressful for him, then he can. Then I'll take a deep breath and I'll wait. Eventually, he comes back around to it and he'll jump back up on the climb because he's either wants more hot dogs or he's ready for ready to engage a little bit more. So same thing, he's up on the climb, I pick up his paw, I turn another nail, I give him a very high value food reinforcer, but he has the choice to get off of the climb. I'm not restraining him on it. And so when we give our dogs choice on whether or not they want to engage in that grooming behavior or any other cooperative care behavior, then it takes away um, any negative feelings or emotions they might have tied to this. And I found that music with mine as that start button behavior has given us a lot of success because there's so much reinforcement value that happens on here. I will say this though, a lot of people will say, don't trim your dog's nails, don't blow dry them, don't do anything mean or that the dog would perceive as aversive on the climb. And I 100% agree with them on that. I would never put my dog on a climb, restrain him and trim his nails if he wasn't engaging in that. If I got to a point where I had to do something that I know was going to be an aversive experience to my dog, he did, um, he, Rue actually is, a, is pretty injured on his paw pad right now from a cut. I'm not going to dress his wounds on the climb. I don't know that I can do everything in my power to keep it as a, a fun behavior um, and uh, and not aversive for him. There, I'll do what what's I'll do what's in my power to do so. But his bandages have to be changed. Yeah. Uh, his wound has to be dressed, and I'll do what I can to keep it not aversive. But you know, as heart, he's not going to want me poking around on a very sensitive, tender area. So I'm not going to practice that on the climb. All great things, um, but grooming can definitely be happy on the climb. Groo grooming can be happy. The grooming is like, don't think it's awful. <laughs> well, and you know, with Rue, like I said, with Rue, with the yeah. nail trims, like he engages with it. Yeah. He doesn't leave. The and it's the, the power of choice is really what it comes down to when letting the dogs have that choice in that matter. A couple of questions that I want to um, point out right there from JoJo. What software do you use to edit your video? We both pretty much just use iMovie on our phones or iPads. Um, if you don't have an Apple device, most Android and PCs all have their own photo editing. So there's nothing crazy that we invest in to edit our videos. It's all done with whatever apps are available to us on our on our smart devices. With one caveat, we actually have a really awesome video editor on staff, Laura Deneo Roy. Yeah. Absolutely love her. Shout, Shout out, Laura. Laura. We love you. So um, for all of the videos that end up going up on our YouTube channel, we use Final Cut Pro, another Mac software. Um, and She's Laura. I love her. One, because she's a dog trainer. So anytime I make a mistake on camera, <laughs> she, catches she, she catches it. <laughs> she makes me look really awesome. Like if I double click something or like I'm walking around with my hand in my treat pouch for like two minutes, she, she won't use that footage. She'll make me look like a really good dog trainer with some expert editing. So shout you out to her. a good dog trainer. Shout out to her for covering up my hands. Um, speaking of good dog trainers, how do you find a quality trainer to assist in training? Um, so where would you go? if you weren't a dog trainer, to find a good trainer in your area. Yeah, um, so there's a couple of different organizations out there. The Certification Council for Professional Dog Trainers is probably the first place that I would go. So that's C, um, people who hold like the CPDTKA um, credential, there's, they have a director directory or a training listing there. That's one good spot to check. Um, and then I will also say this, Word of mouth, word of mouth, word of mouth. Yeah. If you have a Facebook page for your community, whatever it is, Makokita area, buy, sell, trade, whatever. We live in Makokita. Yeah. Uh, or Orlando or whatever it is. Put it out there. Just be like, hey, I'm looking for a dog trainer. Who do you recommend? 
From there, you can review their website, understand whether or not their training philosophy aligns with your training philosophy, um, and kind of kind of go from there. But word of mouth can be really powerful. Um, so if you're having trouble finding someone, you know, definitely check their review their website, ask a lot of questions before you enroll in the class. Um, another question that we have here is a really good one for what's going on in the world right now. Any tips for those who might be getting a new dog puppy over the next couple months that might not be able to pursue a traditional socialization plan, as many of us can't go to business, interact with a lot of people. Julia, you're the next winner of our tree pouch. Email us at customer service at blue-9.com. That is a fantastic question. Um, I'm gonna jump in real here real quick and let Jamie finish it up. This is the perfect time to work on sound sensitization. I can't say that word. Work on your dog not being afraid of sounds. Um, there's a lot of great um, sound clips out there on YouTube, apps and stuff like that. So firework sounds, motorcycle sounds, drop your pots and pans in the kitchen. Um, there's so much that you can do as far as socializing that's not traditional with just meeting big burly men with beards and hats. Yeah. Um, so I think there's there's two real big camps on socialization out there too, and I, I'm not trying to open up a can of worms, but there's this there's a socialization camp that says go everywhere, see everything, interact with everything, do everything, all of that with your dog, and that's fantastic. Um, and so that socialization camp means get pet by a hundred new people a week. Um, or walk over a hundred different surfaces a week, all of that stuff. Learn how um, to uh, eliminate on different substrates. Yeah, that's an important one. So that's one camp. If you're looking at doing sports and all of that, do we want a dog that runs up to every stranger and loves every stranger? Or do we want a dog that can actually work around that as a distraction? So think a little, you can think a little bit more about passive socialization, and this is kind of something that I have in my mind, and that is that I can go and stand outside of a business if if they're if, if they're open and people are going to be engaging at that business, um, and I just want my dog to be able to sit and down and lay down and settle while people are walking around him, not necessarily engaging. He's still going to be taking in that stimulus yep. of a big burly man with a big beard walk by somebody in a walker or a or a wheelchair. It doesn't necessarily mean that they, he needs to be able to engage with them. Um, being able to just see that person walk by and not have a fear response to it, or see that person walk by and also be able to, you know, complete an obedience behavior, that is still socialization, and that's what I want my dog's response to be. Coming from a sport dog perspective, I want him to be able to listen to the cues um, and, you know, eat reinforcers and engage with me in the presence of yeah, all of those different things. Um, so a lot of people say, you know, a lot of people focus on people as the socialization or dogs as the other socialization. There's so much more to it. Think about, you know, some of the struggles that I've had um, with Rue is can we toilet on concrete? We struggle with it. Um, can we walk across grates in New York City? We've had some troubles with it. And so those have nothing to do with people. They have, you know, more to do with the environment and all of that. So uh, think, think a little bit more about all those other aspects of socialization that are not just people. And also realize that, you know, you can still keep that social distancing. You can still keep that six foot distance while your dog is seeing that person and, you know, having, we don't want necessarily a, a oh my God, I must go say hi response. Mm -hmm. We want a neutral response, yeah, really. I, I want a neutral response to any any new person that walks by. So that's a great question. Who is that? And did we reward them? Yeah, Julia. Got it. Ooh, get, no, sorry, whoever's calling Blue Nine right now. Um, <laughs> I will call you back. Any tips for who might be getting it? That's Julia, yeah. Okay, perfect. So, so Julia, you want one of our tree pouches, don't forget to send us a uh, an email. I think we've got time for one, maybe two more questions. We're going to have to wrap it up. Um, but this is, I think, a really important one for a lot of our owners out there from Stephanie Henning. Do you or anyone in the live chat have ideas of ways to use the client for special needs dogs, such as blind and deaf puppies? So, Jamie, how would you um, incorporate that? For, how would you incorporate the climb or elevation training for a special needs dog? I love it. So, if you have a, a dog that is um, sight impaired, 
um, you can scent different objects. And so if you just you know put a dab of peppermint oil or a dab of lavender oil on your client so that they understand where the scent is, um, you can also practice doing different luring behaviors and that sort of thing up onto the client. Um, different body awareness exercises like having them spin around will help them find the edges with your help. Um, so that they don't accidentally step off of it or fall off of it or roll off of it when they're when they're relaxing on it. Um, for that dog, I would also introduce it without the legs installed so that it's just a four inch drop off if they make a misstep and so they're not likely to hurt themselves um, if they're visually impaired. Um, so that, that would be something that I would do. For um, a dog that is hearing impaired or deaf, uh, you know, you can still use all of your visual cues um, to send your dog to the climb. Um, and we do a lot of behaviors on the climb that are just default behaviors. Your default behavior on the climb is go up there, stay there, and don't come off of it until I tell you it's okay to come off of it. Um, or give you a specific release cue. So um, you can definitely have a lot of fun on that. Um, deaf dogs do all of our other conditioning and fitness exercises on them, all of our other obedience exercises. Um, you just have to adapt them to your dog when it comes to visual cues. Um, I love that. I still talk to the deaf dogs that come to my class. Like, <laughs> yeah. They see it on my face when I tell them, like, what a good girl you are, what a good boy you are. Um, I love working with, with deaf dogs. I have not had the opportunity to work with too many uh, visually impaired dogs, though. So um, I hope a couple of other people will give you a couple of ideas on there. I do know that colors cause. Yes. They are, uh, they use the climb a lot for some cooperative care. Uh, they absolutely love the climb, so definitely head over to their page and kind of stalk them a little bit. Um, I know Amanda Fuller would probably be happy to give you a couple of ideas because they work with double merle dogs that are often blind, um, and, deaf. blind and deaf or, uh, yeah, so definitely check them out. So, uh, who was that again? Stephanie Henning. Shout out to Stephanie Henning. Um, you are our final winner for the treat pouch, Inspired Dog Training Treat Pouch. Send us an email, customer service at blue-9.com, and we will get you rewarded. Uh, for all of you guys that have joined us, I say thank you for all of your questions. Gracias. Yes, gracias. Gracias. Uh, if you found anything of value in, um, in this video, certainly hope that you guys will share it with your friends, give them some ideas of different ways that they can engage with their dogs. And yeah, I'm gonna let you wrap it up as I walk over there to yeah. hit our end button. Kathy, I just want to address you real quick. If you have a dog that's chasing things, practice impulse control on your climb or elevated platforms. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You stuck in one more. I did, I did. Good job. Thanks for joining us.